the real-life Scarface, the original gangster, and the king of crime. Who was this man? Al Capone. In the bustling streets of Brooklyn in 1899, Alphonse Gabriel Capone was born into a brutal childhood in a cramped, dirty apartment with abusive parents. His Italian immigrant parents, Gabriel and Teresa Capone, provided a home steeped in Italian traditions, molding the beginnings of Al's complex identity. The Capone family, like many, sought the American dream, but found themselves in a neighborhood shadowed by the presence of the formidable Five Points gang. Capone's early years were shaped by the raw energy and challenges of Brooklyn streets, this being where his path first crossed with organized crime. The Five Points Gang, the dominant gang in the area, became an influential part of his early life, molding his temperament among other things. Enter Johnny Torrio, a seasoned gangster who saw potential in young Capone. Torrio took Capone under his wing, introducing him to the criminal underworld. This mentorship was pivotal, nurturing Capone's innate leadership qualities and street savvy. School for Capone was less about academics and more a battleground, showcasing his growing defiance and predisposition for violence, in multiple cases striking his teachers. These early confrontations with authority figures and minor run-ins with the law were telltale signs of his burgeoning personality. Torrio, a man of vision, recognized Chicago's potential as a fertile ground for organized crime, especially during the era of prohibition. Why? Bootlegging. But this would come later. The city's political and social fabric, already frayed by corruption, provided an ideal environment for Capone's ambitions, even as he served as Torrio's underling. Under Torrio's tutelage, he navigated the complex criminal underworld, quickly learning the art of leveraging both charm and threat. Capone's ascent within the ranks of the Chicago outfit was meteoric. He maneuvered through the organization's internal power struggles with a blend of shrewdness and brutality, soon taking over key operations. Capone expanded the outfit's reach into various illicit ventures. The aforementioned bootlegging became the backbone of his empire, complemented by lucrative forays into gambling dens and brothels. His methods for gaining and consolidating power were multifaceted. Capone was adept at using bribery to buy influence and loyalty, ensuring that politicians and prominent public figures were under his sway. When bribery didn't work, he resorted to violence, employing fear as a powerful tool to maintain order and obedience. This combination of charm, Cunning and cruelty was the cornerstone of Capone's rule over Chicago's underworld, eventually having all of Chicago in his pocket, including most of the police. The St. Valentine's Day Massacre of 1929 remains a stark symbol of Al Capone's iron grip over Chicago's underworld. On that infamous day in February, seven members of the rival North Side gang were brutally gunned down in a Chicago garage marking a turning point in the city's gangland history. The massacre's execution was chillingly efficient. Capone's men, masquerading as police officers, lined up the victims and mercilessly opened fire, leaving behind a gruesome tableau of death. The massacre was more than just a feud. It was a calculated effort to assert dominance and control over the city's lucrative bootlegging operations. The public and media reaction to this massacre was one of horror and condemnation. The sheer brutality of the act propelled Capone into the national spotlight, casting him as the epitome of the lawless gangster era. Newspapers and newsreels vilified him, amplifying his notoriety and branding him as America's most infamous gangster. Investigations into the massacre were fraught with challenges, Capone's well-crafted alibi placed him in Florida at the time, creating a complex puzzle for law enforcement. This alibi, coupled with the climate of fear and corruption that permeated Chicago, made it difficult for authorities to penetrate the veil of silence that protected Capone. In a strategic pivot by federal authorities, 
the focus shifted from Al Capone's notorious violent crimes to his financial indiscretions, leading to one of the most significant legal battles of the era, Capone's trial for tax evasion. The irony lay in the fact that, despite his notorious reputation for brutal gangland activities, it was his failure to pay taxes that provided a legal foothold for prosecutors. The case against Capone was built on meticulous financial investigations, revealing a complex web of income from various illegal enterprises that had never been reported to the IRS. The legal proceedings were a spectacle, with the prosecution presenting a detailed trail of Capone's lavish expenditures juxtaposed against his reported income, which was suspiciously meagre. Capone's defense attempted to counter the government's claims, but the evidence of his substantial income from illicit activities was overwhelming. The largest piece, however, was a list of proceeds received from Capone's criminal activities. The conviction of Capone for tax evasion, rather than his more infamous crimes, was a significant moment in law enforcement history. It underscored the effectiveness of targeting the financial aspects of organized crime, a strategy that would be employed in future cases against mob figures. Capone's sentencing was another momentous event, with the judge handing down an 11-year prison sentence, a hefty fine, and court costs. The public reaction to Capone's conviction was mixed. Some saw it as a triumph of justice, a cunning maneuver to bring down a criminal mastermind who had seemed untouchable. Others saw it as the government attempting to eliminate a folk hero who had supplied them with their beloved booze throughout Prohibition. In 1934, Al Capone's life took a grim turn with his transfer to Alcatraz, the infamous island prison known for its harsh conditions and notorious inmates, a place designed to break the spirits of those who once felt untouchable. While in Alcatraz, Capone's health began to deteriorate significantly. He battled advanced syphilis, a condition that had gone untreated for years and now ravaged his body and mind. The disease's progression led to neurological complications, drastically altering Capone's mental state and physical capabilities. The once feared gangster now faced his most formidable enemy, his own failing health. The Capone who ruled Chicago's underworld was no more. In Alcatraz, he became just another inmate, stripped of his former glory and power. In 1939, after serving a portion of his sentence, Capone was released on parole. His release was not a return to power, but rather an acknowledgement of his severely declined health. The once dominant figure in organized crime emerged from Alcatraz a diminished man, both in physical health and criminal stature. His release marked the end of an era, with Capone no longer a player in the criminal world he once controlled. In the twilight of his life after Alcatraz, Al Capone found refuge in Florida, his days marked by a sharp decline in health and a disconnection from the world of crime. Living under the care of his family, he grappled with the debilitating effects of syphilis, which had severely impacted his mental and physical capabilities. Capone's final years were a far cry from his reign, as a feared gangster spent in relative obscurity until his death in 1947 due to cardiac arrest, a stroker and pneumonia. The man who once struck fear in the hearts of many passed away quietly, his death echoing the subdued nature of his final years. Capone's legacy in American organized crime is a blend of notoriety and fascination. He remains a figure who defined an era of lawlessness and excess, his name eternally linked to the violent and corrupt world of 1920s and 1930s Chicago. However, his life and persona have been romanticized and mythologized in popular culture. Films and books often portray Capone as a charismatic and complex character, overshadowing the brutality of his criminal actions. This romanticization is evident in Capone being the direct inspiration for the character of Tony Montana in the 1983 film Scarface. The movie echoed Capone's ruthless ambition and dramatic rise to power. 
Capone's real-life nickname, Scarface, came from a bar incident where a remark he made led to a physical altercation, leaving him with distinctive scars. This incident contributed to his tough image and became an integral part of his legend.